The following podcast is being brought to you by the Defy Life Podcast Network. Welcome to Aftergate, powered by the Defy Life Network. Aftergate is a podcast series highlighting Colgate alumni of color in their professional endeavors, Aftergate. Aftergate is hosted by Alvin Glimpf, a.k.a. Al, and Herman Dubois, a.k.a. Jerry. We are doing Aftergate because Colgate University has produced innovators who have changed the world every day, yet many alumni of color and the mainstream Colgate community are unaware of the amazing accomplishments of alums of color. Hello, hello, hello. This is Alvin Glimpf, and this is the podcast you all know as After Gate. This is a special episode, uh, not just because it's number 20. We are uh, leaving the teens and going into big, big time, right? We're into After Gate number 20. But we are also with a special guest. So we're uh, always looking forward to these conversations. But this is a, another special one. Um, they all are special, but this is special in its own right. So looking forward to this conversation. For those who don't know, uh, Aftergate, we are just having some amazing conversations with alumni of color, uh, given an opportunity to share their stories on campus, share their stories after they left campus as a way of um, amplifying. I love, I, I like that word. I've heard that word this morning, amplifying the great work that they're doing out there. So, but we, before we get there, as always, let me introduce my co-host, my running partner, Mr. Dubois, down, yes, in, sir. The, down in the MIA. In the Sunshine State. Yes, sir. How you doing, homie? How you doing? Blessed, brother. Blessed. Uh, another day. Alive and free is my motto these days, because you can't even take that for granted. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, just again, uh, you know, looking forward to another opportunity we have to, to build and to continue to engage uh, the greatness and the legacy of our alumni of color. And uh, yeah, just excited about uh, who we have on the show and, and, and sharing her story with our listeners. The, the feedback that we are getting is that the AOC that we have shared so far have been um, some impactful stories in terms of people being able to hear and listen and the impact that they're having around the world has been unnoticed and that is not happening anymore. So. Um, I am honored to be walking this path with you, my brother, um, and uh, we're doing some really good work. And so, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Allow, yes, sir. allow that to fuel you for the day or the week. Cause yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are, we are definitely making a difference, you know. And just for a little confirmation, you know, we got to share with the folk that we got a. Uh, 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 our first formal Colgate love. Uh, it, first formal, it. although although you know what buzz on the street is that you know we're all about what we're doing and is reaching into halls of uh, of uh, of uh, academia up in Hamilton. But uh, you know uh, we we just recently had the opportunity, Alvin and I, to be part of a interview with the uh, managing editor of the uh, Colgate magazine that uh, did a little spot on us uh, and talking about Aftergate and and uh you know the platform and all so stay tuned for uh, upcoming issue months to come uh that will will if you haven't heard about it already you know maybe share a little light on, on what we're doing and then you know boost folks interest to not only listen but who want to share their story because there's too many of us out there doing great things that uh you know folks claim they don't know about well we need to let heads know about it <laughs> that's why do we're we here do. Yes, sir. that's why we're here we have, uh, since our time on walking that campus in Hamilton, we've identified gaps. We have did our, done our best to stand in the gap where we could. And mm -hmm. so here's another mm -hmm. opportunity. Yes, sir. Without further ado, Who do you? let's welcome our <laughs> guest, Lady Wendy. Mm, lady, I like, I like that too. Class of 96, Wendy yeah. Perdomo. How you doing? I'm doing fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Thank really you for, for, for squeezing us in your busy life. You know, yeah, when, you, yeah, when, you're in that, when you're on that executive VIP entrepreneur level, you know, to, to, to get booked in, in, in the same quarter is a big deal, you know? So we appreciate that. 
Yes, but we make time for the mm-hmm. things that are priorities in life. So I never go. believe the hype about the business. <laughs> there we go. There we go. As always, when we get into these conversations, as I do my prep on who am I speaking with today, I go into the glimp files mm-hmm. and say, when did I first meet Miss Wendy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it would have to be the COVID class reunion. Mm-hmm. Yes. Class, I think that was our 20th. Was it 16 or 2011? I think it was. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 2011 because. So it might have been your 20. No. No, our 20th. Our 20th, right? Okay. And maybe because, her fifth. And, and now, their fifth. The, the reason I remember, I'm pretty sure this is it, because it was our, me and Jerry's first reunion coming back. And we were definitely little uh, i'm not sure if this is the right thing going back because um we hadn't really we hadn't gone to a reunion before and we were just a little uncertain about what the experience was going to be like post, we, it, we, we, we we hadn't recognized our post-traumatic colgate disorder at that had, point it was it not. was, it was just something that we were kind of going through an unconscious awakening that through the correct. visit but since then we got we got some we got some theories on that but go ahead Al. we got some theories <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the reasons we had a good time was hanging out with you, your friends, the class mm-hmm. of 96. Yes. And it was clear that y'all knew some of the people we knew because there was some overlap in some of uh, the people who were on campus when we were there. So yeah. that was cool, just having that conversation. But mm-hmm. it was evident that y'all had a great energy amongst, and it reminded us of what we had going on. And it was just good people hanging out with good people in a Colgate way. So yes, yes, that was, I believe, our first time meeting. But since then, and I'm looking forward to hearing your story because um, on LinkedIn, you are doing an amazing job of inspiring people on a regular basis with just Mm -hmm. little messaging with um what you are doing in terms of activities events so i'm looking really really looking forward to hearing how did wendy become wendy Mm, i love that how did wendy become wendy Yeah. yeah so great segue to you are class of 96 meaning you are getting on campus in the fall of 92 Mm -hmm. so give me a sense of what is life like for wendy before you get on campus what's the world like for wendy yeah so great question um so coke was like an awakening for me in many ways you know i uh grew up afro latina in harlem um in you know the 80s my parents uh from the dominican republic uh, right there on 152nd repping for harlem river houses and the polo grounds and um, right. dominicans weren't on the map the way we are more so now right like i used to get confused with being puerto rican and i was like i was fine with it it wasn't a big deal but i felt you know very much you know a part of that community although i was one of the only latinas there uh, all black school um you know, resurrection, Catholic school girl, parents would pick us up, right? You know, when we came out of school, keep us set, safe. From there, Pro- you know- Protected I mean, from protected the elements. Protected and exactly, <laughs> safe and protected. You know, we were it out. I mean, so the, the, the studiousness started to really take, you know, uh, really start to ground itself. Um, and I also was aware, I was a very aware, sort of like I've always been, I've always been told I've been wise beyond my years. And so I knew, we were not affluent, you know, uh, a Catholic school in many ways saved my life. And so it was that uniform, not having to keep up with the Joneses that really allowed mm. me to be able to sort of just fit in even in grammar school, you know, but I grew up with a very pro-Black consciousness. Like I was singing, lift every voice and sing uh, before every morning, 
you know, before mm. anything, right? Like I had to go to the Dominican Republic to learn more about my roots and, and things of that nature because I grew up uh, very black. Uh, and so that's why I have no problems identifying with my uh, African-American, African roots, you know, uh, so, so so that's part of the, the upbringing. And then from there, I went to, uh, to, to Washington Heights for high school, right? Where there was more of the same, but there were more Latinas, right? There were blacks and Latinas. I went to a high school called Mother Cabrini. And which Cabrini! Yes, Cabrini, and it is no longer in existence. And there they started mm. to, you know, it was an all, uh, all, all girls school. So there they really started to set the tone for, you know, how we grow up as young ladies, uh, you know, just a lot of female empowerment. So I did a, almost every club they had at Cabrini really, really sort of uh, started to exercise my leadership while in high school. And then, you know, comes the college time, I applied to a few of the colleges and got into quite a few, but Colgate had that right financial aid package, right? And so Colgate had the right financial aid package. Um, and they were also recruiting uh, in urban communities back then. Mm -hmm. They are not mm -hmm. doing that now. They sent down a bus with Tyree Stokely as the, um, uh, you know, he was the, um, I guess he was facilitating this whole shindig. Yeah. And there I met Christine, I met Rudy, I met Jackie. Um, there were tons of us, they were bringing in from the New York City area, right? Yeah. And so we went up, we had an experience out at Colgate. And so, you know, when, when, the, when the application started coming in and there was the reality of, you know, the financial aid, and there was also that coupled with the type of university I know Colgate to be, even though the diversity wasn't there, I was also going up with one of my girls, Amanda. So, you know, I just said, you know, this is where I have to go. Like, this is where I have to be. Like, I just felt the calling. Um, but then I got to Colgate and I was like, what in the world? You know, what in the world? Because like, the question is like, what was my life before? Mm -hmm. So it was very safe. It was very um, familiar. Also, but also very, keep in perspective the global context because we want exactly. folks who, who don't know what was happening in our nation and in the world as well and how that may or may not have influenced the perspective of why Colgate was safe for you. Well, well, let me just say before I got to Colgate, I didn't have those issues around diversity, right? And so I get to Colgate and the awakening is meeting the Edgar Mirandas of the world and starting to really learn around Columbus Day and really starting mm -hmm. to learn around how our people were pillaged and really starting to learn what that meant, right? And then, you know, we also, I think in junior year, was the O.J. Simpson trial, right? And so I was ready to leave Colgate even with having communities like HRC and La Casa, which I think HRC, forget, 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 tell me, I think we got a floor these days, if, if that, if that, I don't if know. That, if that. And I know La Casa has now become a, a sort of, um, you know, administrative house where these were safe spaces for us, right? And so I almost left Colgate because even with having those communities, I was like, oh my God, this is just feeling, this is not what I am used to. Right. This is not the type of 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 just vibe that I'm I'm used to being. And I was also very conscious of being in a classroom, oftentimes the only, the only person of color, you know, especially because I did a poli sci major. So I got there and I would sit in the back of the room, which was so unlike me, right? Like because I was a leader in my high school. I was uh, you know, salutatorian for my grammar school. So I was always in the front of the line. I got to Colgate and I was feeling the need to sit in the back because I could and really feel my, you know, my the energy there that was welcoming to people who looked like me. However, you know, there are professors there who, you know, can see you. And I have Professor Michael Coyle, who I think is still there. Um, he was uh, running the, he was in the Jeanette department and shout outs to him because when I was ready to leave Colgate, I had a conversation with him because, you know, we had those Jeanette courses to make sure that we oh, had general education about worldly things, right? So, worldly as, so, or, worldly or, or as in Western. Right. Western worlds. Exactly, right? And so, but uh, Professor Coyle was like, you can't leave. Like, he just pulled me aside and was like, you know, 
you're a force in here, you know, and, and he saw things that I didn't see in myself at that, even though I had, like I said, been a leader in, in my high school and in my grammar school and coming there, I was just like, plus coupled with, here we go, the finance piece again. When I started to apply to uh, universities as a transfer student, I think I did American, I think I did NYU. I said, let me get out into the DC area. You know, let me go back home. Woo! Those financial aid packages were like, what, what? I would be, <laughs> I would be in debt till today. And so there was that realization. Um, and then I just started to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, I'm going to make this work for me. Colgate has a, a, a wonderful study abroad program. And so mm -hmm. I don't have to be here the whole four years. We're going to make this work for us. So one year, we all went to the Dominican Republic. And then another year, I went to Spain. You know, Ooh, Madre Patria, awesome. try to, like, understand that dynamic and that um, sort of um, what that means for me in terms mm -hmm. of Afro-Latina, and so... I the was colonial to... elements of the algorithm. Exactly, the colonial elements of the algorithm. I like how you said that, Jerry. And so, <laughs> um, you know, coupled with the, with the community that you saw, Alvin, uh, that weekend, mm -hmm. I was able to stay at Colgate. But, but I felt like while I was there, it was the awakening of what the world what I would be prepared for to encounter once you encounter the world, right? You encounter corporate, you encounter nonprofits. Oftentimes women of color are the only, you know, mm -hmm. um, in, in these spaces. And, and when we're there, we don't always feel supported. We don't always feel the, the, uh, that we have a community. We don't always feel our tribe. And so there are groups, they have employee resource groups that form just like in the university area. We had La Casa, we had um, all of the other sort of um, uh, uh, groups that, they were, that were there to help us, right? And so that's the work of coaching women of color is to support, like you said earlier, uh, you, you enjoyed the use of the word, amplification of voices of women of color in any space that they're in. And, and I, I usually niche as a executive leadership and life coach because I often find that the things that women of color are dealing with in their personal lives also show up in their professional lives. We're one person, right? And we try to sort of fragment who we are, but if you're not speaking up in your uh, at work, if you're mm -hmm. not sort of uh, because it may be a toxic environment or you're working for a toxic voice, like how do you navigate that? Same thing, you may not be speaking up in a relationship that's not working for you and you're and not fulfilling you. So you're you're finding that we are sometimes colluding with fear, and mm -hmm. so that is what I'm here to sort of. I feel like that's my calling in, in nature and, and on this planet to really support uh, women of color in really um, showing up powerfully as the powerful mm -hmm. human beings that we are and manifest the vision uh, that they uh, intend to on this, on this, wor on this world. Wear well, that crown, queen. Wear the crown, queen. And why I, I like liking what you are putting out there is because I want to continue amplify that while I can honor and appreciate what you are trying to do and and lift up that voice of women of color. Mm -hmm. I wanna also remind you that there are men of color mm -hmm. who are noticing that you are lifting up as well because your message resonates. Mm -hmm. And I'm you. just like, oh, hell yeah, I can get down with that. She might not be yelling at me, but girl, I heard you. I <laughs> as, heard a, you. as a matter of fact, to even take it a step further and, and, and not sure if it's something you may already have in your wheelhouse of, of, of uh, of growth, but to to have a male counterpart serve as an ally, which can in many ways not only serve the men population in general, but the men population that are, are, are in, that may be involved with the lives of the women that you're mm -hmm. coaching, because now it truly becomes a holistic effort to acknowledge the greatness in the individual while simultaneously helping folks maybe find each other again because they've yes. recognized and they've had that awakening without getting it into a sort of counseling or mental health space but in yes. many ways but in many ways um I, I think it's very powerful to have that tandem approach if you don't already Amen. i don't already but i am thinking of building an empire and mm -hmm. as i there think of building a coaching women of empire there are so many facets to that work one of which is what you just shared jerry the opportunity to collaborate connect with our brothers and be seen and see them 
right? Mm-hmm. And talk and, and possibly a podcast, right? Like I'm looking <laughs> at a podcast go. inspired by the two of you around having these types of conversations. And so um, I, I thank you for that for that tip, but it is something that I'm mm-hmm. hoping to be doing in the not so distant future. <laughs> Amen. Manifest it. Uh, please know we have a network at your disposal in terms of podcasting. So if there's anything mm-hmm. you, you want to uh, pursue in that realm, uh, just let's let's talk. Yes. Yeah. But yes. before we get too far past campus, mm-hmm. um, were there any um, activities that you were organizations that you were involved in? Give us a sense of what the extracurricular life. Like yeah, that. I'm trying. Like now, see now, I'm trying to get like I'm, like my forty, almost forty seven. The birthday's coming <laughs> in October. The okay, brain. Okay. So uh, there was affiliations with anything mm-hmm. that had to do with dance. I was in it, right? Okay, I do remember okay. that we were. Um, I'm trying. Look, okay, y'all gonna have to help me here. Uh, uh, Kumba uh, was a. Kumba was definitely. I was in Kumba. Okay. Um, there, were, there were there was a Latin dance group too. There was. I, I was in the Latin dance group. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, lasso. La- the, how can I lasso. forget Lasso? I was in Lasso, right? And um, the Alana Cultural Center was obviously a a, a, a safe haven, right? I worked a hub there. of programming, yeah. Yes, a hub of programming, right? And then I think you know, and I lived in La Casa. I lived in HRC, and you know those those uh, those places had you know events, and they you know whatever we would do, mm-hmm. or re- we would we would participate, and so so yeah, those were the, the types of activities I was in. I was more in the participatory uh, phase. I don't think I ever moved into the, you know, being president or running okay. any of yeah. the the, yeah. the actual um, organizations. But I stayed there because I knew that being connected was a way was a lifeline. It was a way of me um, being able to stay at Colgate. Like for me, the ability to sustain those four years was making sure that I stayed close to the community that was there, right? And they we were so few and far in between that that is what I think is, is makes us such a strong bond. Like, mm-hmm. you will see some of us in the city anywhere and it's like what Kate like we there is such a strong bond I I would say even stronger than maybe in some other universities that are probably historically black uh, colleges Mm -hmm. because we needed each other in order to survive and thrive Mm -hmm. you know like and 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 there was love on the upperclassmen too you know we I became Hassan Brown Craig Parkin Dimension like you know Jerry you had already left but the but but the, the fact that we still knew you Lorraine uh, Fabia, mm. like all of those ladies, you know, um, all of them, like they, they, they loved on us and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, Edgar, you know, paving the way. And so it was, it was, it was just a very, um, uh, connective tissue in terms of, of how I felt safe and protected by, by virtue of the upperclassmen and the love that they gave us. And that's, that was really the way in which I was able to survive and thrive wow. there because I was able to stay grounded in those communities, in the, in La Casa, in the HRC. Um, and so it's, it's kind of interesting to, to see that those communities are no longer there. Um, well, sh- shout out to Fabia. I haven't heard that name in yeah. Fabio. Yeah. Orleans, right? I yeah. think that's the last name. Uh, yeah, yeah. Month, of, month of Sundays, as my mother used to say, I have not heard that name because mm-hmm. uh, we went to the same high school. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you talk about Colgate sending students back to New York City to whether it's on that uh, subfrosh weekend bus. Yes. Or as me and Jerry. Yes. Yes. Me and Jerry would go back and speak to our alma maters, our high schools as a way of um, sharing the Colgate brand and uh, Fabia uh, went to August was, High School. Was a recipient of one of those workshops. <laughs> a recipient of one of those workshops, without a doubt. Um, so when you look back, and let me just say, um, you, you mentioned the word sustaining. And as you talk about not being a quote unquote leader mm. in these organizations, one of the things that I'm reminded of is that when it comes to sustaining these organizations, 
that leadership is um, part of it, but I also think, as you said, participating is another mm -hmm. layer yes. of sustaining those organizations. Because absolutely, uh, having a we funk party but nobody come, we funk's not going to last too long, right? Exactly. So while I was never an official member of we funk, I feel like for four years I was at every one of their parties, yes. and, and I looked like I was. Uh, I feel like I was part of their journey as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to play a role in all types of different ways when it yeah. comes to sustaining our organizations and leaders of color. Mm -hmm. uh, but so just generally, like when you think back at those four years, how do you um, how do you look at things that you accomplish? So, you know, personally or, or organizationally, what would you look at as accomplishments of those four years? Yeah. So, again, like one of the things I remember was coming into Colgate and being one of few especially in the poli sci department. So I have to tell you one of the things that I made sure and some and, and one of the reasons why Colgate was always attractive was not only because of the financial aid package that was huge, but Colgate is also a very small university, right? You don't get lost there. So I would find myself sometimes in a class where I was one of maybe four or five in certain in certain instances. I remember having a class with, I forget her name now, um, but I'm not going to try to get there. Um, but the point is that I was in the class with this poli sci professor and I had her twice in that semester. And I, I was like, okay, they not gonna ever catch me off guard, right? Like they are never gonna ask me a question in this class and I'm not gonna know, I'm gonna be humming a humming a humming a. So this class was at one o'clock and I would wake up at 10 a.m. and I was like, I am prepping for this class because when I come in here and I'm one of four, I think there was a football player. I forget who else was in there. I, I wanna say, I wonder if Amanda Peel was in the class with me. One, I just remember there was like me. I felt the, pop, the, the, the like eyes are on me. And if she asked me something, I, I had this like, I got to represent for myself and I can't be sitting here like I don't know what I'm talking about, even though sometimes this class is a stretch for me. And so that is one of the ways in which I adapted. Like I really immersed myself in what they offered, but I also was like, I'm not trying to be one of these students here of color that they're going to call on and they're going to be like, oh, you know just write her off type thing. So I did utilize, again, the resources that Colgate had. Um, I also, um, you know, I was actually really good at writing, you know, surprisingly enough, right? So I read a lot of books when I was in high school because it was part of the way Cabrini um, really, you know, it was, was was supporting us as as students. So we had stuff like summer reading books. And so I had a very strong reading orientation and, you know, good readers make good writers. And so I was already a writing tutor in sophomore year, already looking at papers from juniors and seniors coming in. And so I, you know, that's another way that I, that I made, you know, I was able to survive there. I had to work <laughs> Colgate and work in multiple locations, one of which was the writing lab. Mm -hmm. I also worked over at um, the Alana Cultural Center. And it. then, you know, uh, I had some, I, I never worked at Frank Dining Hall though, because when I got there, Davo was like, you know, the honeys can't work at Frank Dining Hall. I was like, what? <laughs> He gave us a, a a stigma on that. So I was like, okay, okay, we can't work there then. But then, you know, a lot of people did. That was just stuff, you know, stuff that you, you, you're you impressionable at 18. So that is, um, you know, how I I, uh, uh, I survived at Colgate. Like really, again, um, getting ready before the class, making sure I showed up in my class classes and, and, and then taking advantage of the opportunities that they had, like going abroad, um, and then just pacing myself, you started to, when it, especially when it started to get to senior year, I realized that the study abroad programs has set me back um, a, a credit. And so mm. while other seniors were like floating and coasting their last year, I was, I, I literally was missing a credit. And the thought of not graduating with my class was like, oh, wait a minute. So once I got tuned into that, I ended up uh, asking uh, one of the professors to do an independent study with me. And so I had to really drive very hard towards the end. And I had a lot of papers I remember like that were just all on top of me very much towards the end. And I mean, I could have procrastinated. I could have not paced myself. I could have 
of just act like, okay, I didn't know these papers were here. So I think one of the ways that you, you know, you start to sort of prepare for life that Colgate really helps to support you and that you start to sort of, you know, um, build is, you know, just uh, planning ahead, which is Organi organization things. skills, organization skills. And it has served me well. And, um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm happy to be able to say that, you know, it, it still serves me well today. You know, every now and again, I do procrastinate because sometimes there's something to be said about doing something under pressure. It's not something I highly recommend. Sometimes it's even better than when, if you would have planned it in advance. It just, you know, it depends on how passionate you are around that particular project. But in this case, especially when it came to my years at Colgate, there was just way too many papers and way too many long papers for me to wait until the very end. So a lot of planning and a lot of um, making sure that I stayed close to my people. It's funny you said a few things that I want to, if you don't mind, uh, just kind of highlight because although we joked about it at the beginning, you gave two perfect examples of what I sincerely believe contribute to this ideology around the student of color experience and what I've often referred to as the post-traumatic Colgate disorder because it's not until when you're in it. You're in it because you're 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 submerged in those frequencies. So when you talk about being the only representation in the classroom or being one of four, and now and having to f go through the mind, the mental manipulation to mm -hmm. to to convince yourself and 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 alter your psyche in mm -hmm. one of two ways. In one of two ways, it was either nah, I'm not going to be that stigma stereotype that they think I am because of what mm -hmm. I've already experienced in other classes that. I've made my I've, I've been made to feel a certain way, whether it be by our professor or classmates. And so we ain't gonna have that, especially right. in not in a subject matter that's my major, right? And I'm and this is supposed to be what I'm claiming. You know, I might I might tolerate that in some other class, but not 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 this, right? And then you talk, you reference the uh the the other uh experience about sisters not being able to work in the in the dining facilities because I know that as a as a, uh, there was ego for me mm -hmm. and, and and I needed work study. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to freak work study on every way possible i was on there negotiating my hourly weight when it was 325 <laughs> and i was exactly. minimum wage like how are you disrespecting me like this but the point at the end is that i too had this ideology as like i ain't working in the cafeteria i ain't serving you white folk i'm just not doing it i'm not doing Hello. it and I, I will i will have a different kind That's of experience right. at colgate you know and so i had to really check that but i didn't know that it needed to be checked i was just like i ain't doing it and so cultural center job, admission job, or everything admin, because I felt like I needed to establish that, yo, there's other things we can do besides working the dining hall. <laughs> yeah, but like, let me just say, and uh, just add up to that, I didn't work in the dining hall, but then I ended up working in the pool area. We ended oh. up cleaning, cleaning the gutters. All right. Mm. And so and then so you're avoiding one thing for another right. thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're avoiding that piece of like the stigma of, you know, of of you working in the kitchen or serving, you know, white people and all of that that comes up. But then I'm I'm, I'm cleaning gutters and I'm doing these tours and the tours are all white folks. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and here we got a few folks of color cleaning the gutters. Right. And that was one of the higher paying jobs, which is. And so so it's also something that stayed with me as you're talking about mm, it. And, and, mm. and just to follow up on this notion of 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 grinding, because like like I had to really prepare and I really had to get ready so that I didn't appear a certain way. And, you know, that is where that started. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to appear to these white teachers and white professors that I don't know my shit excuse me, ish, I know, I'm not, you know my ish, right? I don't know my ish, right? And so as a result, that starts to get inculcated and indoctrinated mm -hmm. in, in how you show up everywhere. And it starts to create this level of perfectionism, which is- How you see yourself. Things, how you see yourself and how you have to show up in the world always ready, you know, armor, you know, I got it all together. And it's not that when I work, especially when I do the working with uh, coaching women of color, that I don't want women to be mediocre, right? Like I also am not a proponent of perfection. I think, you know, we have to strive for excellence, but we can do excellence through ease and flow, right? And so what happens is we are raised to like, you got to grind, you got to do this, you got to work hard, work hard, work hard. And we burn ourselves out. And it is part of sort of the 
the the the the patriarchy in in terms of how society is set up that that is what is valued you work hard you sort of suppress a lot of your feminine the more you become uh, in terms of masculine energy grinding working hard make that paper show up a certain way and fundamentally it, it leads to more of what i see when i'm working coaching with women of color burnout Mm -hmm. depletion, unhappiness, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes a lack of connection to self because they start to realize there's something more. And so part of the work, um, and, and it was that was a fabulous sort of connection, Jerry, in terms of the notion of like how you have, like I was showing up in, in these classrooms. That's where, you know, that's before I could work with others, I had to do the work myself, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I think the belief with when it comes to coaching is that we coaches are out here and we are blessing and 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 working to support women in my case women of color to sort of amplify their voices and really live out the vision and the manifestation of whatever their goals and dreams are but we also are doing the work on ourselves and we mm -hmm. coaches need coaches in order to be able to not get some of the stuff that we're working through or bring that to our clients because that's another start when you start to do this work you'll notice you will attract mm -hmm people who are very similar to you with mm -hmm. regards to the work sometimes i've attracted a client that's me mm -hmm. uh, maybe a few years ago and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like whoa take that look at that universe mm -hmm. uh so mm -hmm. so yeah awesome awesome with 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 all that and, and rich robust reflection and making the connection over the over the, the years there and 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 post colgate what do you miss what do you what do you if you had to highlight the things that uh are, are, are those standouts that, uh, you know, stay fond in your heart. And so what, what would they be? Frank Dining Hall. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, but beyond Frank Dining Hall, I will say, I want to speak a little bit around the world we are right now. Like, and I think we alluded to that in, I mean, we are all separated because you're in Miami. I don't know, Alvin, where you are. ATL. Um, and, uh, ATL, right? And we're doing a podcast. So by virtue of the fact that it's a podcast, it obviously has to be virtual. Mm -hmm. That said, there is a shift that is happening right now in this world with regard to how human beings are connecting. And uh, Colgate, again, because of the fact that I had the HRC and I had La Casa, I had this community of tight sisters, uh, mm. brothers and sisters, right, that mm. I could count on and were there. That, that, that just, that, that connection mm. is, is something I miss because as you, you know, you, you graduate, you all, everybody goes about life and you, you know, we have things we do. We, we all evolve. We have our, our jobs. We have our families. We have our partners. We have all these things happening that we were all, we were already there. It was not like a forced connection, but we all lived together, right? And so, and, and I mean, you could choose, even though you were there not to associate, but that wasn't my way of being. I was an extrovert and I love being with my folks. And so, you know, I always was, so to speak. And so now as an adult, those are, um, those, those instances are fewer and far in between. And you really have to be very intentional about the connections that you are, uh, creating and cultivating in your life. You have to go the extra mile to, to, to make sure we stay connected versus back when we were at Colgate, we were already there. And if we wanted to kick it, we could. We wanted to, you know, just hang out, we would. If there was a party, we'd go to it. So, so, so that I miss, that level of community and connection is something. I'm a if you haven't heard or, or, or felt it by now, I'm a people person. <laughs> I thrive off of being around others and I do need my self time. We all, all of those who, who are extroverts need our, our time to, to sort of recharge, re, you know, and, and reinvigorate on our own, but I love to be around others. And so the world that is now emerging um, as a result of this pandemic uh, creates a buffer for us to be able to do that with less fluidity in with uh, the way we used to do before right like mm -hmm. we, so so that's something that very tangibly i can speak to i miss that aside i'm also a go-getter so i do make it my business to as i say i miss that to stay in contact and connection with the people that i love and so mm -hmm. i do mm -hmm. still have very strong bonds uh, from my colgate days with you know, my whole Facebook community is practically all Colgate and, <laughs> and, and, 
you know, and in, in LinkedIn, it's, it's starting to amplify there and, and, and extend. So, so, so yeah. So, so, so yeah, that, that, that's what I mean. <laughs> it's time to take a quick pause, but um, let's definitely not um, overlook that message of connection of the authenticity that we as people need to show up. And uh, we're going to take a pause right here as we give some love to our sponsor and then come back and finish this conversation with Wendy. So this episode is sponsored by Hope Murals. Hope Murals is a nonprofit that provides adolescent youth with an interactive experience of creative expression via an urban arts platform that stimulates both mental and physical development. Please visit their website at www.homeheroes.org to learn more and find ways you can support the work they do. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. We are still here with uh, Lady Wendy. But before we get into the second part of this, you like that, Lady Wendy? I do. I love giving people nicknames. So you'll probably be Lady Wendy to me for like the rest of uh, your life. I'll just, hey, Lady Wendy. That's who you are to me. Now. I'm good with it. Let me just make sure we thank our sponsor, Hope Murals, because um, they are continuing to do some amazing things with our adolescent youth. So <laughs> want to make sure we shout out Hope Murals. Make sure you check them out on the website, hopemurals.org, to show some love, give them your support, find out more about what they do. If you are interested in being a sponsor, please email us at aftergatepodcast at gmail.com and we also want to make sure we give some love to our network the defy life network and so if you're interested in listening to other dope shows a couple of them i am on myself if you want to hear more podcasts like these check us out at the www.defylifepods.com and you can also find aftergate on many of your favorite podcast streaming services from spreaker to spotify to apple pods we are on all of those. And if you're also interested in written content, check out www.godefylife.com. And you can also check out their branded apparel at defylifegear.com. Ooh, mouthful. (laughs) But I'm going to pass the mic to Mr. Jerry and lead us into the second half of this combo, my brother. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we're here with the uh, illustrious one, Miss Perdomo. And uh, as you, as many know, you have this amazing sort of uh, service, that, professional service that you provide in, in life coaching and, and serving women of color. Um, yep. Aside from the industry and the service that you provide directly, talk a little bit about sort of what that journey was into that role and particularly what do you, what, what might you share in terms of some of the personal challenges you've encountered with, with, with sort of going in the direction of wanting to be this independent entrepreneur um, with a market that clearly has a need, a market that clearly uh, benefits from what you do, but still, nonetheless, it's not a turnkey situation. So share a little bit about that journey for, for, for those folks of, who, who, who are maybe in that similar place or, or in, in, or thinking about going into that, into that journey of, of independent entrepreneurial services. Yeah. So, I mean, the journey from a personal perspective, because I think that's where you would like me to start. Um, I have to say that oftentimes what I find and what I have shared with my clients is that our biggest breakdowns in our lives create our greatest breakthroughs. And so very vulnerably, I, um, I'm divorced. And so as a result of my divorce and really uh, finding myself in a space where regardless of what I was going through personally, I still had to show up in the workspace like there is no room for us to you know fall apart be messy the ugly cry the boogers none of that when you are an executive an executive director when you are leading people you must show up you know always in form and ready to conform and so i started to really notice that that there was a disconnect between my personal life and you know, and, and I was going through it, going through the valley, through the shadow, um, as I'm navigating a divorce, yet 
in my workspaces, there's no room for that. And so um, eventually the divorce happened. It was a time of immense personal challenge. And I had always been in the realm of professional development and training and um, have if you've noticed if, if for, 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 for the listeners, one thing that I have been sure that I've shared throughout today is the importance of the community, the mm -hmm. women in which you, the champions, the people that are surrounding you, because that will say a lot about who you are and, and your vibe and your energy, right? So I had always been surrounded by women of, of power who were also of color, who were also up to man magnificent things in the world. And so I had gotten uh, an invite from one of my good friends, Mor Mauricier Degovaya. Uh, who's a superintendent over at New York City Public Schools and, you know, up to wonderful things with her work. And she had invited me to an event um, for Landmark. I don't know if you've all heard of Landmark, but Landmark is a, is a training institute that does a lot of work in the realm of personal development and transformation. And I had been in the field of, of training for many years, but never this type of training. So I, I was First of all, she sent it to me really late last minute. So I was like, why would she send me something so last minute? Because I can't support my sister. It's on Tuesday. She sent this to me on a Sunday. You know, like, you know, we're busy people. But it stayed with me. Like, I read up on what it was that their particular program was about. And then I enrolled. And so that started my journey in terms of personal transformation and really understanding um, the work of ontological coaching. Because that's the type of coaching that I do, which is really focused on the study of the being. How we show up in spaces and who we are in these spaces, who we are being creates the outcomes that we manifest for ourselves mm. in these lives. So like for those of us, and I say this to my nieces all the time, for those of us who are, who are, who are world up here is really focused on looking at, at, at what's not possible on scarcity, on, on, I can't do this right now. I don't have enough money. Um, I, I got to lose some weight. I got to get a man, all the stuff that starts to sort of collude up here, that is what we will manifest. We end up colluding with all the fear, all the limiting mind steps, all the beliefs. And so fundamentally, you know, I really became interested in that level of coaching and started to explore coaching programs. And I then, because I also felt like I always had a knack for it. And I was always an active listener in high school. I was always that person people would come to and want to just talk to and not only hold the secrets, but also be able to give some, some insights and support. And so I felt like that was a natural gift that I hadn't really curated. And I was looking for specific programs and I was coming across a lot of the programs that were university driven, but they were very grounded in in theory. And so I wanted something that also dealt with the heart, the heart and head connection. And I came across a program called Accomplishment Coaching, did that program for an entire year. And that really shifted the cadence of everything, because what it really did was in order for you to show up as a powerful, you know, uh, transformational coach, you have to be able to first do the work yourself, right? You have to really look at where your stuff is and be able to address those things and be willing to do that on a continuous basis because that's another thing around this work i think people think that you work with a coach or that we're miracle workers and that all of a sudden these limiting beliefs and these behaviors and these practices that don't serve you all of a sudden go away they shift right like the self-saboteur and the way you think about things will become less and you amplify that less but it's still there all of us it's part of the human experience right and so um, so, so the journey was really getting myself skilled up, educated, becoming a badass professional coach. That was very important to me, especially as a woman of color. I needed the credentials. I felt like I wanted the credentials. Um, and there is that duality, right? Society requires the credentials of us, mm -hmm. right? But I also mm -hmm. wanted to be very good at my craft. And I went to an excellent uh, institution for it. And, you know, I stand by what I do uh, wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the journey. The challenges, believe it or not, was as I started to come out of this program for my coaching program, I very quickly identified uh, with someone who was going to help me build my website. And I remember him and I having a conversation and him telling me, he was like, he had an intake, right? Where, you know, in order to build a website to really get connected mm -hmm. to the entrepreneur, he asked me a question about who I wanted to coach. And I said, I could coach anybody. You know, I'm coming off my confidence game. I was like, <laughs> I could talk to anybody. And he was like, yes, you can talk to anybody. But if you talk to everybody, you're not talking to, you, like, if you talk to, he said, 
everybody, you're not talking, like anybody, you're not talking to everybody. It was something to that effect, like you're talking to, you're not focused, right? And so I was like, okay. So I had really started to feel a very deep calling for working with women that looked and sounded and were like me, right? Like a coach, coaching women of color. And believe it or not, some of the challenges in the early days came from sisters who were like, I was limiting myself. In, in terms of just niching for women of color. Like there is beliefs that women of color do not, do not have money, will not be able to pay you the way a white woman will, right? And will you, you, you're limiting yourself in your ability to be able to really build your business if you're only focused on women of color because white women pay. So you should, you know, when they want something that, you know, and I was just like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't care. And it was jarring for me to hear mm -hmm. that from sisters, right? So we still have so much work to do in terms of how we think about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And that did not deter me. As you see, my practice is still called Coaching Women of Color. Uh, there have been other iterators of, and marketers who have come and also have tried the, you should shift it, you should change it, you should amplify your niche because you really um, have a message that can serve all. I absolutely do. And if they'd like to join, they are welcome to join, but my focus is women of color. I am unapologetic about the uplift of Black and brown women on this planet. And so that is what I will continue to do until the days that I cannot do it anymore. And so, so that was a challenge at first, like the whole sort of just um, really targeting my community and getting that level of support. But then there were also sisters and brothers who were like, right on, keep going. Exactly. This is what we need. And so once I did that piece in terms of just, um, really identifying with my community, then the next piece is, as you've mentioned, Jerry, the transition of continuing to sort of move from the nine to five, which I am still actively in, by the way, into the entrepreneurial journey. So I think the three things I would like to share with the listeners around this is that first you have, a, have to have, like you hear me say how I'm, I'm unapologetic about the uplifting of black and brown women on this planet. You have to have a vision that calls you forward every day and is really inspirational to you that you're just like this mm -hmm. is what I want to do on in this world and it it, it, it really like mm -hmm. it gets you up mm -hmm. out at night you know like up in the morning you see my body moving and I hope they'll see it too mm -hmm. that you know that that I think you have to have that vision I like that to refer to it as a what is the conviction you have every day that's going to get you out to bed because that day is relevant to that journey. Exactly. Um, and, and, and that's an, and, and, and a lot of things in life. And so conviction has become something for me as I've gotten older that it, it defines purpose. Right. So the conviction, I love that word. I'm going to incorporate it into my portfolio of words, right? Conviction, the vision. Then the second thing I would say, which is that community, the classes, the connection, get yourself educated, get yourself around the champions, get yourself around the people who are going to collude with the next level of you. Oftentimes we have to shed people in our lives that are no longer serving us and don't see the vision as greatly as we do, right? Like you do not always, you're not going to go to your nine to five uh, colleague for advice around your entrepreneurial business, right? So you have to start to move into those networks of community with like-minded people who are going to support you in the next level of the work. And, and, and that vision and conviction also has to be around a taboo area that we don't talk a lot about. How much money do you want to make? How much money do you need to be making on a monthly basis so that you can leave your nine to five? Mm -hmm. Like, let's talk numbers. And if you are not as familiar with your numbers, third, hire a coach, right? Mm -hmm. A business coach, someone who is going to help you navigate that mm -hmm. terrain and is going to keep you inspired, going to keep you accountable, going to keep you in action plan orientation to get you to where you need to be. So vision, conviction, uh, community classes, connection, you know, get the knowledge, collude with your champions, not with people who you don't, you know, who don't see your vision. And then three, hire a coach, I think, and a business coach even more so. So that way you're really specific in what it is you're seeking to manifest in your business. So those are three things that I think are really important that listeners should know as they try to move into that realm. And those were some of my early challenges uh, in this work.
I, I wish we could just take that whole little excerpt and make like an infomercial, right? And it's like, and if you are the one of the first hundred callers right now, you'll get a <laughs> personal consultation on where you're at. And no, that was awesome. That was that was that was that was very concise, and I, and I appreciated the way you sort of gave them their own love, but then brought them together, um, collectively, commutatively to to serve. And it was a nice reflection on your personal journey, but at the same time, a good model that folks who have their own journeys can can apply. Um, to their life. We jumped ahead a little bit because that was a beautiful uh, testimonial to sort of like that process and 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 the uh, the steps you've taken. But let's go back even further. Uh, okay. can, can you can you can you take us now post Colgate? And so now you're 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 graduating Colgate and yeah. walk us through a little bit of some of the highlights and and, and peaks and valleys of of your walk from Colgate to you know sort of what you've become now and where you you know what your career has taken you personally as well as professionally. Yeah, so after Colgate, you know, I remember when I was in Colgate, I was always in the career center. You know, again, this, this for you. dichotomy around the haves and the have nots. Like mm -hmm. I was in Colgate, you know, my mother would send me a, a care package. It had platanos and salchichon in it because she, she never came back, y'all. They dropped me off that first year and they never came back four years later. And so Hello. this world that we're in where, you know, all the other kids are getting these LL Bean boxes. Hello. And, you know, these J. Crew boxes. And I'm just like, Ooh. J. Crew. Exactly, J. Crew. So then when the same thing when, when we're graduating, right? Like some of the our, our counterparts, our white colleagues, you know, they had you know, some, 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 some very big roles waiting for them. Mm -hmm. And even though I had a four year degree from this prominent institution, I was still struggling to get a job. I was so like, what in the world happened? What, what did I miss? <laughs> what did I miss? Was there, was there, was there an orientation I missed? I was supposed to go exactly. to that <laughs> came with an envelope and a job. <laughs> exactly. So I was, I was, I had to adjust to that first and foremost, because I felt that how could I be unemployed? And I just graduated from Okay, like, you know, this, this doesn't even make sense. But I, you know, again, the the, the teaching of like, you got to grind, you got to get out there. And so I ended up moving into the nonprofit realm. And I started first at, as, at a nonprofit called Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem, where I was working as a team administrator. And they were, um, you know, supporting uh, the, the criminal justice system. And this was during the Giuliani days and really mm. a public defender, right? So I was working mm. on a team of public defenders. And I started to really be Become even more present to the injustices of our community, and unfortunately, Up frisk. you know exactly. And so, <laughs> but I didn't last there long because they were shut down. Because back in that time, Giuliani was just coming into the foray of uh, leadership at the New York City as as mayor, and so they were not getting the funding that they needed to get. And so, shortly, quickly thereafter, I ended up moving into the educational arena, right, and making a jump to work for an organization called the Brotherhood and Sister Soul, which is doing fabulous, amazing work um, in uh, the Harlem community with regards to our black and brown kids and really has a fantastic program from soup to nuts. So you, that's definitely, um, you know, Kari Lazar, right? So I started their Sister Soul program um, because they only had a brotherhood component, right? So again, you're starting to see the vestiges of that sort of empowerment of being of women of, of, of like, and so we called it Sister Soul so that it would have that dual component of, of like the sun and soul. And that program is running fantastic. And then um, after that, I made a leap again into another nonprofit doing financial literacy work called Credit Where Credit Is Due. I love the names of all these nonprofits. All right, right. You know, okay. Brotherhood is <laughs> soul, Credit Where Credit Is Due, um, the, uh, Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem. So I did a lot of grassroots kind of work in our communities that really um, developed this sense of equity for me, and it is part of what, you know, I have navigated and continue to navigate through through to today. So that then led me to a role over at the New York City Department of Ed. I spent 10 years there um, in a variety of different roles. Um, and, and then I uh, ended up working at the state uh, under Commissioner John King, who was also our uh, Secretary of Education under Obama. So that was a wonderful, a fantastic time working there. We're a team of like real cutting edge innovators on work that had never been done at the state level, diagnosing um, the schools and really seeing what uh, schools need to do new and different in order to show up more powerfully for our kids. And so I had created a diagnostic tool 
uh, that was being used not only at the school level, but we were also holding the superintendents accountable for the work. So that was a whole paradigm shift there. And then, you know, through that work, I ended up realizing um, as, uh, through that educational work that the real lever of change when you come into education and in the school is the principal. Sometimes when you leave, uh, good leaders are important. If a good leader is not at the helms of a school, you will find that sometimes, uh, you know, you have all kinds of things going on. So then when I started to look for employment after that two year stint as a fellow, I ended up coming to an organization where I'm still working at right now and I oversee their entire professional development infrastructure, their management training program, their coaching, their employee relations, and they are called New Leaders. And New Leaders is all about making sure that they are training the next level of leaders, particularly Black and Brown leaders, to take on the challenges of, of, of our American education system in some of our most disenfranchised communities. And so I have a staff. Um, um, I don't have a staff. That's the problem with nonprofits. I, I have employees of 100 150 and I am uh, it's a one it's a two to one ratio uh, in terms of the work that I do so speaking of some of the challenges if I may sometimes you know in nonprofits we've got to do better those of us who are leading nonprofits to make sure we have sufficient human capital in order to be able to do the work but nothing here nor there with regards to like I know we have a lot of CEO founders that are out there trying to do what they can to get that money. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a balancing act. And so that's been the journey. And so now for that organization, I am really focused on, like I said, I oversee their whole professional development in infrastructure, but I've also been called forth to lead the equity efforts for the organization, which is, um, you know, a very powerful uh, uh, a workflow. Um, I am trying to really move from making sure that we're not doing performative equity, where we're just checking the boxes on mm -hmm. things, but really ensuring, um, because equity is really part and parcel of that organization's mission, but really ensuring that we are are, are embedding equity in the fabric of everything that we do, right? Like it became this big thing at the height of the George Floyd murder. Um, yes. And some organizations, including, I have been contacted by some organizations who wanted me to do work, but then they don't continue, right? Because it, that's that performative equity. Like, let's just check the box. Let's just show people that we're doing stuff because this is something everybody's got their right. eyes on. That's Compliance. not the kind of organization I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of, and I'm not, right? Like we are at the helms of, of creating an organization where anti-racism and equity is at the forefront of what we do. We speak it, we believe it, we integrate it. And it is not an easy task, right? Like having those types of conversations in the workplace and holding people accountable for their behavior, sharing with them, this is the situation, here's the behavior, and here's the impact of your behavior, right? Because there is... There is, there is work to be done on multiple fronts, um, including with our own people, right? Like, you know, because we are, we are oftentimes the um, recipients of this white supremacy, right? And so we download the behaviors and sometimes use it against each other, which is another layer of the work that no one likes to talk about, but it is there for us to also examine. So I know that was a really- No, no, that was awesome. No, that was right on. That was right on. That's awesome. And you are also right on in that so many of us, when it comes to this concept of equity and your person of color, leader of color, you're thinking, oh yeah, this is the work that they have to do. Right. And, and it's, you know, you're like, oh, cause I'm good. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a brother. I've been a brother all my life. I don't need to be checked. Cause I'm no, then you start doing the work and you really understand the biases that you are bringing into this work and how it's impacting some of the outcomes that you are achieving. Yeah. Um, so great, great, great insight. Um, I'm curious as you, uh, Lady Wendy, you are a badass coach right now. <laughs> when you look back at Wendy mm -hmm. coming into Colgate mm. and then Wendy leaving Colgate, Mm -hmm. Wendy, the badass coach, mm -hmm. what would you give as words of wisdom to that Wendy who's coming into Colgate? And what would be words of wisdom you would give Wendy as she's leaving Colgate? Mm, dang, that one is kind of like, oof. Um, so it's the Cabrini Wendy coming out, right? Coming out of Cabrini High, big fish, little pond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it's the uh, welcome to the world, Wendy, 21, leaving Colgate studied abroad, did all that. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that what I would say this new this the evolved transform badass coach Wendy to that Wendy is uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, you know, accept failure for um, for what it is an opportunity to learn. No mm-hmm. one could have told me that back then. Like mm-hmm. failure is any type of failure, be it you know, you got a grade you didn't get on your, on the paper, or, you know, you, you, you had a fallout in a relationship or, you know, whatever it may be, no one back then could have told me that you could have silenced that inner critic that comes, that would come up and just beat, beat me up. You mm-hmm. should have did this. You could have did this. Maybe if you would have said this on the interview, you know, like, and then it would, it was so loud. It would talk to me for days on end. Right. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the new Wendy mm-hmm. and uh, evolved Wendy and is, is, is one that understands that failure is part of the journey. Yeah. It is part of success. You cannot get to success without failure. And we are taught and raised that failure is embarrassing, that it is to be hidden, that it is to be put down somewhere where no one can ever see it because nobody wants to see you or hear about your failure. And yet it is the key ingredient in like I said at the top of this call, those breakdowns are what create the breakthroughs. And so I think I would be able to say, you know, live a little, you know, not that I didn't, I was just like, don't be so hard on yourself because the internal dialogue back Mm. then. That self-talk. Oh, oh, that self-talk. She was mean. She was a Mm. mean, mean, mean. Mm. I ain't gonna say it. You know, she was mean to me, right? And, and you carry that with you and, 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 it becomes you and and then you're you there you know you're you're in this place of like what you're feeling and experiencing it and what you're outwardly trying to portray mm. which 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 creates a fundamental disconnect and which happens and so part of the work that i do is always trying to heal mm. that mm. part of us that feels like we got to beat that part up you love on her love on her uh, she's been through a lot mm-hmm. that part of us is what got us to, uh, here and she's always going to be there but don't let her run the show so to me like what you're talking about is the distinction between what what a teacher and a coach like what because to me that what makes a really really good coach is the ability to look at um a lack of success or failure and understand what's the positive, what's the, what's the coaching point here? How do I build thinking big picture, looking at this as part of the process. To me, those are the great coaches who are understanding it. You can teach somebody how to do something, but if you can't help them when they are stuck and they haven't achieved it, if you're helping them to say, well, here's how you learn, here's how you build on it. Understanding that this is part of the process. Yes, this is That's part of the journey. You cannot circumvent this. This is it. You've got to go mm-hmm. through it to get out of it. Mm-hmm. You can't mm-hmm. skip that part. Right, no, right, no. right, right, right. So uh, before we get out of here, we got a Colgate question. Sure. And you being that entrepreneur, I'm curious to know, is there any aspect of your Colgate journey mm-hmm. that you attribute to who you are as an entrepreneur today? Listen, I think, and I, I mean, this is going to be my, maybe each podcast has a, has a theme. I'm going <laughs> to yes. say, I'm going to say community, like mm. my Colgate community that sustained me through Colgate. I also, again, I'm in a coach community. I've got my little WhatsApp groups of communities that I've in. I've got my family community, right? Community and the the the, the, the friends that I made, because I have to say they're friends that I made yes. at Colgate, right? They have really sustained who I was back then and they have continued with me throughout these years. I just did um, the, I think the brunching for women of color at Colgate that Veronica McFall uh, hosted. I was mm-hmm. one of their keynote speakers for their wellness uh, conversation. And there were so many of my sisters on there from my days of being at Colgate. And that was beautiful just to see the sisters uh, supporting me. And so that that community and that support, because entrepreneurial journey, especially the low parts, when you're like, when you have moments of like, oh, 
I'm not making the money I want to be mm. making, or I'm not, I haven't made, I haven't launched the product in a few, or you start to get the comparatitis. Oh, look at them over there. They doing more than I'm doing. Oh, listen, the water, the, 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 they say the grass is greener where you water it. Don't worry so much over there. Worry over here, focus on you. Right. And so when you have those self doubts uh, that come up, cause they emerge just because mm. you're doing, it doesn't mean they don't emerge your community and your people and the, and your entrepreneurial colleagues and friends and having those that squad um, is going to support you and it's going to help you. So I learned that from the connections that the tight connections I had at Colgate. And that is still something that I feel very deeply sustains me today. Mm-hmm. Not comparatitis. No, no comparatitis. Don't be worrying about over there. Mm-hmm. I told a client of mine recently, the grass is greener where you water it. Don't focus Amen. so much on over there. Yeah. You got to look yeah. over here. Focus on your, 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 water your pot, fill your cup yes. and see how everything starts to flourish from there. Amen. Lady Wendy, <laughs> we're going to put a pin in it right there, but that Thank is you. a great way to wrap it up. I am so glad honored to be part of today's thankful. conversation. Thankful, y'all. Very thankful. And um, thankful to consider you part of um, our network. And uh, it's awesome, awesome, awesome. So the Aftergate community welcomes you officially, even though oh, you ain't never yes. left. But, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and with that, we always look for the opportunity uh, to plug and, and, and show love to our guests by giving them an opportunity to share how folks yeah. can reach them. Yeah. Um, both both personally just on some yo wp in the hizzy to yeah. no this is <laughs> to, to 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 this is what i do professionally and yeah. if interested in folks being able to reach out to you whether it be through your personal uh a sort of independent coaching work or even through collaborating through your uh, organization which i'd love to learn more about who you work for because i know yeah. that there's a need for those services here down south which unfortunately tend to not be as progressive as some of my counterparts up north but that's why I'm here. Oh, so with that being said, uh, please plug away and and, yeah. and and let folks know how they can reach you in every which way possible. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so folks can reach me at Wendy at coachingwomenofcolor.com. I do breakthrough sessions all of the time. So just you can easily just send me an email. It ain't that hard. Sometimes like these coaches out here, they make it hard to do business with you. So Wendy at coachingwomenofcolor.com. And we can set up a breakthrough session. We can, you know, see what's what's in your space and, and take it from there. I'm also going to be relaunching my Bold Women of Color Take Action Now series. So please stay tuned in November. Uh, I, I'm not going to give the date because I put, I, I'm going to mess it up. Once I get the flyer out, it's coming out. And that's going to be a monthly series and conversations where I uh, just basically talk with women of color about what professional challenges they're having. And they come into a safe space and we do coaching. We do some hot seating and we get some community and collegiality going on. And um, you can also follow me on Instagram, WPerdomo74. And I think that's it for now. Yeah, you know, Wendy at Coaching Women of Color and my website is www.coachingwomenofcolor.com. You can also sort of contact me through there and and take a free empowerment assessment and we can jumpstart the conversation in terms of what are some of the areas that you are seeking to grow in. Because if you take that assessment, I'm able to see what's going on in advance. But then when we have the conversation, I really get really present to what's happening in your life. So. Mm. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Um, you grateful um, for not just being here today, but just being in this world and who you are and making this world a better place, right? So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the two of you for doing the same. Love y'all. Love you back. Uh, This has been awesome. (laughs) Wendy, thank you to our listeners. Um, Remember, this is the Aftergate podcast powered by the DeFi Life Network. You can hear us on all your favorite platforms and make sure you check out many of the dope episodes to follow. Peace. Awesome. You hear that? Listen closer. That, my friend, is the deafening sound of focus. It drowns out all the useless noise that can clutter the moment. Naysayers don't exist. Haters? Smaters? The peanut gallery? Who's that? When you're in your zone, all that noise and all that buzz is just elevator music. So, Enjoy your journey, focus on your goal, and bask in the quiet roar that is progress. Because when it's your time to shoot that shot, 
spit that verse, or close that deal, the only voice that matters is yours in my life.